Hi everyone, this lesson is on an overview of what we call post-term pregnancy and also the condition known as post-maturity syndrome. So post-term pregnancy is a gestational condition, so it's a condition that occurs during pregnancy, that involves prolonged pregnancy up to or beyond 42 weeks or 294 days of gestational age. Another way to define this is that it is the estimated delivery date, so whatever clinicians have estimated is the time for delivery plus 14 days. So once you hit that 14 day mark, then you have or are considered to have post term pregnancy. And the typical time for delivery is going to be anywhere from 37 to 40 weeks. So once we get past 40 weeks and especially up to 42 weeks or beyond, then we have post term pregnancy. Now, the etiology or cause for postterm pregnancy isn't entirely understood. We don't know exactly why some individuals get it and some don't. But there are certain factors that increase your risk for getting or having a postterm pregnancy. One of them is what we call preemie parity, which means that this is the first time you become pregnant. Another risk factor is previous postterm pregnancy. So if you've ever had a pregnancy in the past that was also postterm, you're more likely to have it again in the future. If you're pregnant currently with a male fetus, that also increases your risk for having a post-term pregnancy. Being obese is also another risk factor. It increases the incidence of post-term pregnancies and family history. So if a pregnant female has other family members who have had post-term pregnancies, they are also more likely to have it themselves. And in fact, what we would call the most common cause of post-term pregnancy, and it's a cause in quotation marks because it really isn't a cause, is inaccurate dating. So if the dating is off, and this is often going to be the one of the biggest causes, again in quotation marks, of post-term pregnancy, then it's really not a true post-term pregnancy. So if we're able to correct dating, then we're often going to be able to remove some of the cases of post-term pregnancy. Now, about 7% of pregnancies can be post-term, so it's not a very rare thing for this to happen. And post-term pregnancy is very important to catch because the incidence of stillbirth increases linearly with increasing gestational age after 39 to 40 weeks. So once a female has been pregnant for more than 39 to 40 weeks, the chances that they will have a stillbirth increase dramatically. So the longer a patient goes pregnant and they don't deliver, especially beyond 40 weeks, then we get a very high risk of stillbirth of the fetus. And as we will see later, there's other risks that can occur to the baby and the mother. So we'll talk about those later on. And these risks increase with increasing age or increasing gestational age as well. So why does post-term pregnancy occur in the first place? So there are several hypotheses as to why it occurs, but one of them is the what we call placental clock. Now the placenta is the organ that is developed that attaches to the endometrium of the uterus. It will essentially draw out nutrients from the endometrium and funnel those nutrients through the umbilical cord to the baby. And the placenta produces its own hormones and one of them is corticotrophin releasing hormone or CRH. So some individuals might recognize this hormone. This hormone is actually located in our brains as well. And this is a hormone that can be produced by the placenta. And what is found is that it increases in levels with increasing gestational age. So when first pregnant, we start to get a production of CRH or corticotrophin releasing hormone from the placenta, and it rises linearly up to a potential threshold that will usually occur at a maximum threshold of around 37 to 40 weeks gestational age, right when the infant is being delivered. So we can think it like this. Once placental CRH levels reach a certain threshold, that's going to indicate that this is a time for delivery. Now we can see this also being different in premature deliveries. So in premature deliveries, the slope of increase of placental CRH is actually higher. So we get a faster increase in placental CRH that peaks earlier on at the time of delivery. And again, premature delivery is going to occur before the age of 37 weeks gestational age. So we get a faster slope and we get that peak of placental CRH earlier than we would with a normal timed delivery. Now with post-term pregnancy, this is going to be the opposite. We're going to have a lower slope of increase of placental CRH that peaks out later after 40 weeks of gestational age and even up to 42 weeks and beyond. So this is 
one of the main hypotheses as to why we're getting changes in delivery time because of how the placenta and how much the placenta produces and releases CRH. And again, this is termed the placental clock to indicate when an infant is going to be delivered. Now, this placental CRH has its own functions. It's likely involved in fetal growth, in fetal brain development, etc. But nonetheless, placental CRH levels are correlated with when an infant is likely to be delivered. Now, let's talk about some of the post-term complications. So there's going to be both complications to the mother, so maternal complications, and there's going to be fetal complications. So maternal complications are going to include postpartum hemorrhage. So there's going to be bleeding after delivery. So they're at a higher risk for bleeding after delivery. Long labor is also another risk factor. There's also other risk factors, including perennial tearing. So because the infant becomes larger, there's more tearing, there's more damage. As the delivery occurs, there can be shoulder dystocia. So dystocia levels can increase as well in mothers with infants who are delayed in delivering. Now, with regards to fetal complications, these include stillbirth. We talked about that. So as the gestational age passes 39 to 40 weeks, we get a very steady and very rapid increase in incidence of stillbirth. Other complications can include macrosomia, so a large body. That makes sense. The infant is still growing over time. So because of this, we're going to have macrosomia, and this ties in with some of that damage we talked about that the mother can undergo or an experience. Meconium aspiration is also another important complication here. So meconium aspiration is where the infant has a their first bowel movement, which is what we call meconium, and they end up aspirating it. Because it's inside the uterus, that meconium can be inside the uterus, and then there can be an aspiration of that meconium. So aspiration meaning that it gets into the infant's lungs. So this can lead to issues after delivery, including issues with breathing, cyanosis, etc. And then what we're going to talk about here in a moment is the increased likelihood of post-maturity syndrome. So let's talk about post-maturity syndrome. So post-maturity syndrome is also known as dismaturity syndrome. It's going to occur in infants who have delayed delivery, so in post-term pregnancies. So it's essentially like they're maturing too much while still in the uterus or in the womb. Now, some of the findings we can see with post-maturity syndrome include the following. Fetal weight loss, although the body of the infant gets larger, so we get a macrosomia, they can start to lose weight. So they end up having issues with weight loss occurring while still in the womb. And more specifically, they can start to get reduced subcutaneous fat. So the fat under the skin starts to thin, so they get end up getting thinner skin. They can also have dry, scaly skin. So there's excessive desquamation of the skin. So it can look something like this. They can have a long, thin body. What can often be described as wide-eyed and worried look. So when they're first delivered, they have a sort of what we would call a worried look on their on their face. And then the palms of their hands and soles of their feet are extremely wrinkled. And they can also have long hair and long nails. And they can also get oligohydramnios. So the amount of fluid inside the uterus starts to shrink and they can have other issues due to that. And then they, what we talked about before, they have increased frequency of passage of meconium that can lead to meconium aspiration. And some other effects that can occur include the fact that they can have issues with hypoglycemia after being delivered. So they can have low blood glucose levels after delivery and also respiratory insufficiency. Now, there has been an old study performed to see whether or not there are long-term effects of post-maturity syndrome, but it doesn't seem like there are. At least in a follow-up study of children of the ages of 1 and 2, their general IQ, physical milestones, and their immune system functioning were all within normal range of other infants that were not born with post-maturity syndrome. So that's some evidence to suggest that there aren't any very long-term effects, but there are some very important short-term effects of post-maturity syndrome. So how do clinicians diagnose and treat post-term pregnancy and post-maturity syndrome? So a lot of times it's going to be important to do proper gestational age calculations, especially from last menstrual period. So if we do proper calculations, this can aid in diagnosing this. And fetal ultrasound can also help with aging as well. 
And then with regards to post-maturity syndrome, it's often going to be a clinical diagnosis. We're going to see a lot of those features we just talked about in an infant who is post-term. So that's also going to be important for diagnosis. How are these things treated? So it's important for induction of labor. So induction of labor is going to be important at the right gestational age. So we don't want to go beyond 39 to 40 weeks because of that increased risk of stillbirth, but there can be some failure of induction in some cases. And even in the case where we do induce for delivery, there can be increased rates of C-section and also maternal complications we talked about before, including some of that perennial or vaginal tearing and shoulder dystocia and also the C-section itself. So the treatment is going to be preventing becoming post-term in the beginning. So you just want to avoid even becoming post-term going beyond 40 weeks gestational age. You want to avoid that. You want to induce labor. And then with post-maturity syndrome, because they may have some issues with hypoglycemia, some issues with respiratory insufficiency, we're going to put them in neonatal ICU for some time. And oftentimes they will be okay after a short stint. So I hope you found this lesson helpful. Please check out my other gynecology lessons if you want more information. Please also consider joining as member for members only content. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you again soon.